hello, hello, and welcome or welcome back. I am so excited today to be talking about not Miss Taylor Swift, but another one of my absolute favorites, another one of my queens, if you will, Miss Lana Del Rey. Now, Lana, she's very, very popular. She has a lot of fans, a lot of stands, a lot of people who listen and participate and show up when she releases something. But I think for a lot of people, she is someone that people have like one specific connection point to. She kind of pops up into the greater public consciousness every once in a while for one reason or another and then kind of dives back down under the radar in moves in a way that only her fans really know what's going on if even that. I feel like there are people who know her from her Born to Die Ultra Violence Tumblr Flower Crown era. They know her from her song from the Great Gatsby movie or they know her from one of her various moments or scandals on the internet throughout her career. As a stan and as a fan since the Born to Die Tumblr flower crown era, I was not there before Born to Die hit Tumblr like an aesthetic melancholy cigarette filled semi truck, but boy was I there when it did baby and I loved every moment of it and I have been riding along ever since. I wanted to go through the Lana lore. Welcome to Lana Lore 101 today. We are going to go from the beginning of Lana's origins in her personal life, her rise and breakthrough into the public consciousness through the success of Born to Die and Ultra Violence through the end of the Endless Summer Tour. And then we are going to pick up in Lana 102, our next Lana Lore lesson with the beginning of the honeymoon era, because I really feel like the break between Ultra violence and honeymoon was kind of like a gap and a breath and a shift in the Lana universe as we know it. So that is what is on tap for today. Let's get into the beginning lore of Miss Lana. So she was born June 21st, 1985, a cancer Gemini cusp, which is just so incredibly fitting, makes absolute perfect sense to her mom Patricia and her dad Rob in New York City. But when she was one year old, they moved to Lake Placid, New York, which was a small town where she was raised Catholic and her younger siblings, one brother, one sister, were subsequently born. She was kind of a perpetually anxious, existential, preoccupied child. She was very fixated on the concept of mortality and death. I kind of had like a, a phase like this when I was a kid. I was a very anxious child, very hyper fixated. Um, and I did have like this weird mortality phase. So I do, I do kind of get it a little bit. It sounds like this was really deeply depressing and distressing to Lana though, in a really longer, larger way. And it made making friends really difficult. Um, as one could imagine, I definitely had a hard time making friends and it wasn't even as heavy for me as it seemed to be for Lana. And so this led to alcoholism and then spiraled in to just more and more trouble and attempts to cope as she got older. So by the time she was 14, she spent one year at the high school where her mother was a teacher. And then they found a way for her uncle who was in admissions at the Kent boarding school to help get her financial aid set up so that she was able to transfer there to essentially get sober because a boarding school might not be a rehab, but it is very monitored. You know, you have roommates, you have hall mothers who know where you are and where you're supposed to be. You you have ground that you can't leave. You can't just like go out. She really still struggled there. She had a couple good friends that she kind of had like a small group with, um, like a group of three. And like when you're in a big school, having two friends, like it's great you have those two, but also like they're not in every class. Like you still feel very alone. And she said that she felt weirder at boarding school. She felt like her depressedness and her issues really made her stick out like a sore thumb more and made her feel even more out of place than she had been in her small town. In 2003, she graduated from the Kent School and moved straight to Long Island to live with her grandparents. For a year, she lived there and she worked as a waitress. We do not 
not know where, if you have any idea where, um, comment down below. Let me know. Everyone is very curious. I'm sure it like doesn't even exist anymore, but it'd just be interesting to know. It was also during this year where her grandfather taught her to play the guitar, which she absolutely loved and got really, really into. She was really mesmerized by the idea that you could create so much with just a handful of chords and she absolutely loved it and really took to it in that way. During this time, she said she was always singing, she was always performing, but it wasn't really anything she intended on pursuing seriously. So she played local gigs in bars, in clubs, especially in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is, you see throughout her work, a real pillar of inspiration for her and a little bit like a home for her creatively. Um, Brooklyn and like the city of Los Angeles are very deeply inspiring to her and she really like feels pieces of herself in both places very clearly. And so this is definitely the start of that. She very much thinks of herself as being from New York City and refers to a lot of parts of her past in New York City. And so this is definitely kind of where that starts. During this year though, she decides that she wants to go to Fordham in the Bronx and get a BFA in philosophy. So she starts there in 2004 and moves to the Bronx and her degree has a focus in metaphysics. She said she was really focused on bridging the gap between God and science. She wanted to figure out how technology could bring us closer to finding out where we came from and why. So it's really interesting. It seems like her like morbid fixation and her being raised Catholic really joined together in her mind for her to be like, I want to be a part of figuring out why things are the way they are on both sides, the people in religion and the people in science. Those are the people who are talking about mortality, you know, and I feel like they both have something important to say and I want to figure out how they can play together and I want to feel figure out how one can kind of help us complete the other, um, which I find so incredibly fascinating, number one, and number two makes so much sense for her and her work. She really brings up philosophical concepts about life, not only love but life and death a lot. The concept of philosophy and the metaphysical and science versus God and science and God, um, those just kind of come up in her songs as things that she thinks about and really inspire her and she muses on very frequently. Um, and it's not in just one album, it's kind of woven throughout. So in 2004, she started at Fordham, but she was kind of moving around um, performing and doing gigs in Brooklyn. Like I said, she got really, really attached to the Brooklyn music and artistic scene. Um, and she said her and her friends were like right and singing songs but it was really mostly for them at that point at their like local spots local shows but then in 2005 she entered a songwriting contest in Williamsburg and she didn't win she got pretty far she kind of got like close to winning she was in like the final round um basically and one of the judges was a man named Van Wilson and he was an executive at Five Point Records and they currently had no other acts which is not Good. Um, when you are a record label who needs artists to make records to make money. So he saw her, said, I like her work, and they signed her, gave her a $10,000 advance to record a record. She used that to move to a trailer park in New Jersey where she commuted back and forth to the city to go to school until she graduated in 2008. It's during this time that she is kind of exper experimenting with different images and stage names. May Jailer among them, that's the name under which she released her demo Sirens. That's kind of like the earliest of hers that you can find, but by 2008, her her EP Kill Kill is ready. She releases this under her name Lizzie Grant. She had been performing as Lizzie Grant and the Phenomena and moved to the Maid Jailer thing but she landed for this first EP release on Simply Lizzie Grant. It was a three-track EP in 2008. By 2010 she released her debut album, her first that was not an EP, that was self-titled with the name that she had settled on, Lana Del Rey. This is kind of well known. It comes from 
from one of the most glamorous stars of all time, Lana Turner, whose glamour she wanted to emulate and was mesmerized by. She loved the glamour of old Hollywood and was really fixated on the perfection and the grace of Lana and how she really fully embodied a Hollywood starlet archetype. The phrase Del Rey, which is in a lot of areas near the marina in Florida. She was spending time there with some of her friends. She really loved the environment there by the marina and loved how the words sounded on the end of so many of the places. So in the beginning of 2010, that debut record is released and in April she met her new would-be managers and told them that she didn't really feel like things were going anywhere. They helped get her out of that deal with Five Point and she moved to London while she was dating one of them and she acted in a short film called Pulsa. I don't feel like this was the beginning of Lana's interest in film and the Hollywood environment and film as an art form. I think that was very much something that she was interested in and then this probably opened up her appreciation and interest in it more and I find it interesting how she incorporates it into her work in ways ways that she wants to and that work for her and her art. relationship with the Hollywood starlet um, specifically is very very interesting and is so present throughout all of her work because even when she's not specifically dealing in film or mentioning Hollywood, she talks about concepts that are ever present around the starlet so frequently. I digress from London this was where her self-made music videos to blue jeans and video games were released. Now she had been writing, um, kind of collecting songs for a new album to release under her new management and she had self-made music videos for these two songs, Video Games and Blue Jeans. Video Games she released first. She said she chose it because it was her favorite and she wasn't really expecting it to hit so hard but it had really been resonating with people. Now if you haven't seen this original Video Games music video, it's like like very much something you could you too could have made in 2011 her being recorded on photo booth so like someone had to set up a laptop and just her in front of like you know a plain wall staring sultry with like her lipstick and her hair perfect and like you know her her wings her lana makeup and just having that very serious sultry face singing and then it's cut together with these just like found stock footage shots of light up signs in hollywood and american flags waving and the chateau marmont a couple in a park on like a date and friends like kind of like laughing and giggling about something, um, a skateboarder on a street, but also um, people playing string instruments. And it's funny, the people playing string instruments is actually their shots from Fantasia. Um, I don't know if you remember during Fantasia when they show the actual orchestra and the conductor. It's not much, it's just in the beginning, but she actually uses shots from Fantasia and she cut them in when you can hear like some of the classical instruments playing. They're very like dramatic, um, like orchestral shots. Um, Cause you just see like the silhouettes of the conductor and the musicians. So she used those. Um, there's also some shots from like Call of Duty and some like cartoon things which are questionable, but it's all very, it's giving authentic in the way that people on Tumblr would want something to be authentic. You know, it's cutting together all of these different aesthetics underneath this song um, that's really kind of trying to tie them all together. Not only this song, but this video um, from her makeup to her moody stare to the way she sang to like the tone of the song and the kind of like old film grainy um, choppy way the clips were cut together. It was just so perfectly curated to be served to the people who were reblogging the pictures of mascara teary eyes you know it was just like a shot here of just like a ton of mascara and eyeliner and just like super tearful eyes like those pictures and the ones that were like cigarettes with quotes about emotional and physical pain the people who were reblogging that stuff from their parents family computer this was 
the perfect meal for us. These songs were melancholy and longing, um, not only longing for love, but also pain. <laughs> the love and the pain both. Like we were already in on Twilight with the whole like brooding and sexy, obsessive, dark alternative situation. This was that, but make it glamorous, make it slightly different. Um, it's not trying so hard to be popular. In fact, it's a little bit off. It's a little bit old fashioned, but in a cute way, in a palatable way, in a way that says, you are not like the others if you like this. This is special and this is good and this is deep. And those are all of the things that a moody Tumblr girly in 2011 was begging to be. She was sad, she was horny, she was wondering what the hell she was going to do with her life and Lana was there to support you in that dread. And it's so weird because it's such a like, common thing for us now, the like alternative, not like other girls, like moody female artists. The internet was perfectly hungry for something with her ingredients, the nostalgia, the grunge, the, the deep feelings. You know, we had a lot of things at that time that were very shiny and party and happy and be you and uplifting. We were LMFAOing, we were Katy Perrying, and this was like speaking to the feelings of dread that made us feel that we needed those songs, but it was also something new and different. You know, it wasn't something that had been done before. It wasn't old. It was taking things that we detected as old, like live strings um, and old Hollywood glamour images, and it served those to us in a new way to where we could now appreciate things that we knew we kind of liked all along, but we really liked them now that they were tied up in a new shiny package. And that's what I think is so amazing about Born to Die and what I think that we loved so much about it was that there were things from the past that we had always thought were aesthetically pleasing and nice, but like it was boring to like those things from the past. Lana brought them and she made them aesthetic. She made them new and she did it in a way that we wanted. We were sad. We were begging to have permission to smoke a cigarette because we all in the back of our heads were like, it does look very cool in the old pictures. She, she fulfilled that need. She spoke to that thought. <laughs> and so the Tumblr kids loved it, but it was also good music. It was different. It was layered. It was interesting. And so the popular kids get sad as well, or at least they also like to feel sexy and tortured every once in a while. And so even though there weren't like a ton of massive radio hits on this album, there weren't any teenage dreams on this album, it ended up becoming massively recognizable to everyone. It felt big and specific and different in the same way that I was trying to be different when I reblogged a photo of a woman in winged eyeliner in a 1975 t-shirt. People would reblog like her lyrics and her face and her aesthetic before even knowing like who she was and so she kind of just slowly was everywhere without even being on the radio or having like won a Grammy or being big in that mainstream way. She was kind of everywhere though. If you showed her picture to someone, they'd be like, ah, that girl. Even celebrities were fans of her and were like mentioning um, video games and blue jeans as like songs they wanted to hear more or songs they were a fan. So she signed a joint deal with Interscope Records in mid 2011 and then Born to Die was released in January of 2012. Now between in the signing and the release, Girl, Girl clearly had like tracks. She clearly had like most of this album like ready to go from her years in London and like the work she had done there and up to this point. But people were starting to be mean to Lana on the internet. People, the internet was starting to have not so nice things to say about the girl with the flower crowns that everyone was loving on Tumblr. And the things that they were saying were that she was an industry plant. People 
were not pleased when she bought back her first album, Kill Kill, from her original record label. Um, although the label says that she did it when she first parted with them in 2010, her and her camp say that she did it in this January when Born to Die came out and people were all weird about it and they were saying, well, why would you do that if you didn't want to hide it? Why wouldn't you just let it be out there? And like, at the time they were saying that they were going to re-release it. That didn't happen, but it could very well be because she just didn't want to re-release the song. She didn't like them anymore. She didn't feel like they were songs that she was interested in re-recording. But people took that and they ran with it. They were saying that she had already had a ton of plastic surgery done to her face to look the way she did and that her hair was fake, her nose was fake, all her lips were fake. All of these things were fake and they were all to curate this perfect Tumblr girl image you hit right now with the alt girlies on tumblr which to be fair yeah she was perfectly curated to hit with that crowd it wasn't because she was an industry plant though it was because she had a brand that was working for her god forbid and also we have since learned that there are a lot of reasons that someone might want to own their previous work instead of letting someone else have control over it. So that wasn't the best. And then unfortunately, she did also face criticism for her SNL performance that happened just a few days before the album released. People did not think she sounded great. People notoriously on SNL do not always sound great. It is notoriously a difficult audio environment. And she said she was extremely nervous as one would reasonably be. That was on the 14th. The album released two mixed reviews. Went on about this for way too long, but basically when Born to Die came out, the critical reception was not great. And it wasn't even necessarily people were saying the music was bad. They were saying she was inauthentic and they didn't like this character and this image that she was presenting. They didn't like the off to the races, Lolita vibes of it all. They found it concerning and bad. They just kind of were like very much side-eyeing her and seeing her as a shady figure in pop culture. They had nothing to do with like the music or the production or her voice really. If they had anything to say about her voice, it was really kind of built off of the dissonance that was created by the SNL performance and people really liking video games and blue jeans, but then not really liking that performance at all. It all kind of became muddled and meshed up into Born to Die not getting great critical reviews when really in hindsight, like Pitchfork did, Pitchfork rescinded their original review and like re- released it basically and gave it a higher score. I think that the subject matter and the persona really was what got the reviews. But chart-wise, it did really, really well and songs from it hung around in the Hot 100 for over a year. Her first tour, her Born to Die tour, actually kicked off in November of 2011 before the album even dropped. It was an international tour in like, kind of like mid-size um, like theater venues. But that went all the way from November to September of 2012, a couple months before she released the Paradise EP. And I think this also, we're going to talk about why I think the Paradise EP objectively did better than Born to Die in the moment, even though I feel like Born to Die was the better work. But I think part of the reason was because she had had so much exposure from so many people seeing her on tour by the time Paradise came out. This was definitely the most widely palatable of all of her albums due to its like pop aesthetic and like very clear strong direction and vibes. Like this was like a full Taylor Swift era level of aesthetic and she never really fully did that again. I feel like as a Lana fan there are differences between the Lana eras but none so distinct as Born to Die because this was her most pop girl adjacent moment. It was the most radio friendly music that she's ever made. It was the most boppy music she's ever made. And so I feel like a lot of people associate her with that album for good reason. Born to Die is also the biggest PR push, the most publicity that Lana has ever done. You know, this era was the era in which she moved most like a pop girl, a pop star. And I don't think she liked it. I think she hated it. I think she had a bad time and I think people were 
not nice. And so I think she decided that that is not something that she's interested in doing again as part of her album cycle. I definitely, some of my favorite Lana Del Rey songs are from Born to Die. What can I say it is one of the few albums that I will listen to from front to back. And part of that is because it is so sonically cohesive. It has a very clear aesthetic and point of view and it really sticks with it the entire time. And it's a world that you can jump into and really feel like you are a part of the entire time you're listening to the album. And that's what I think Lana consistently does with her album so very well. The world of Born to Die though is such a glamorous, pretty shiny, loud one that I think that it's one that is incredibly inviting and easy for people to want to jump into and spend time in as opposed to maybe an album like Blue Bannisters or even Tunnel Under Ocean Boulevard, which I enjoy spending time in, but I'm not always emotionally um, there or ready for. I think Born to Die really allows you to groove with it and have a good time with it while maybe you're feeling some of your feelings. I think the things that Born to Die allows you to do while you are within the world of it really speak to why people love it so much. Born to Die allows you to be sad, desperate, sexy, angry, and elated all within like the same time span and like ain't that being a girl like this is what makes us girls. <laughs> so from the release of Born to Die we actually really moved swiftly in to to kind of the like tale of the Born to Die era. I feel like this is why Born to Die felt like such a long era to so many people is because Born to Die and Paradise Edition really sort of like conglomerated into one and this made the Born to Die era like effective three years long. But in September of that year, she released her cover of Blue Velvet and then the first single from Paradise Ride. To me, Blue Velvet was the first signal of a trend that we've seen ever since. And it is people love Lana's voice. There's a handful of artists that just have voices that people absolutely love to listen to. And so they are asked to do songs because people just want that sound for this song, for this movie or they want a cover of this song in that artist's vibe. There's only really a specific handful of them. Adele is another one that I can think of that it really elevates the song and makes it hers in a way. Lana does the exact same thing. And I think the her cover of Blue Velvet is the very beginning of the trend that we see of her covering songs and being asked to do songs specifically because she brings her specific Lana-ness to them. I think she did a great job with Blue Velvet. I grabbed right onto it when it came out. I actually liked it more than Ride. I know that that's like kind of an unpopular opinion um, because I know Ride is the song that Chapel Roan references um, in one of her songs, but wasn't my favorite, still isn't my favorite. So sorry. Paradise debuts in November at number 10. Paradise was and actually still is separate from Born to Die. Um, even though they were released in the same year, Paradise is an eight track EP, Ride, American, Cola, Gods and Monsters, Yayo, Bel Air, Body Electric, and her cover of Blue Velvet. This is actually what was nominated for a Grammy for Best Pop Vocal Album the following year. This was actually her first top 10 debut. It debuted at number 10 of the Billboard 100. I personally, and this is a hot take, I think Born to Die was better. I think Paradise just got this attention because people loved Born to Die so much that they were primed and ready to listen to Paradise when it came out. And so that's why it got more attention. I actually like Born to Die as a collection more than I do Paradise personally, but that is just me. Let me know what you think. I do really like some of the songs on Paradise. One of my favorite Lana Del Rey songs like in my top 10 is from Paradise. Now, if you had originally thought Paradise and Born to Die were kind of the same thing, same era, I wouldn't blame you because what was later released was Born to Die, the Paradise edition, and it was like a two disc set of Born to Die and then Paradise with the bonus tracks all together. That is actually, if you look on my Spotify, all of my like early era Alana songs are saved from the Born to Die Paradise edition because it has all of them. And so I'm pretty sure I just have like most of that version of the album saved. Now, remember when I said that there was a real trend with Lana of covering things, her doing songs for films because 
her voice and her aesthetic and her vibe brings something different and specific and new to them. This really, really starts to ramp up here because we get the release of her covers of Leonard Cohen's Chelsea Hotel and, and Nancy Sinatra's Summer Wine, the latter of which is with her boyfriend, Barry James O'Neill, who she'd been with since London in 2011. He is a Scottish musician. Something else I kind of wanted to bring up here is just with these covers that she chooses to do, you can really see kind of the connection between her and Lady Gaga, even though she did on Kill Kill release a song fully dissing Lady Gaga. They were both kind of coming up and starting in the New York circuit um, around the same time, but they were just very much different people coming from different perspectives trying to do different things, but they both seem to take inspiration from the New York City scene just in different ways and then also from real classic American music. Gaga with her Tony Bennett affinity and then Lana with not only her like classic references but also her covers. In spring of 2013, two kind of bombshells happen. One, I would argue, was bigger than the other. One, she starts her Paradise Tour, her longest and most successful tour yet, the one that will conclude in the fall of 2013 in October, where she performed at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. I simply hate um that i was not an adult and i could not attend this show also the lead single for the great gatsby movie young and beautiful drops now lana had actually already had this song written along with body electric and gods and monsters for paradise but she had had it tweaked a little bit to fit the movie and then it was picked up to be the lead single this i think was huge for Lana. Um, Young and Beautiful was nominated for two Grammys and debuted at number six. This did not need to be changed much to fit the Great Gatsby movie. I don't know if it was her people that reached out to the Gatsby people or the Gatsby people that reached out to her people, but either way, this was just such an easy match. I don't find it hard to believe that she'd already had this song written and called Will You Still Love Me prior to it being attached to the Gatsby movie because it has all of the qualities of a Lana Del Rey song, the old Hollywood charm, the live instruments, the whistle wistfulness, the echoing, the gorgeous vocals, and it all lends itself perfectly to this 1920s aesthetic. Like if I was doing a modern Great Gatsby movie and I saw Born to Die being released, I would so quickly say, that lady, that's the one we need for our lead single. I don't know who she is, find her. Begging to be put <laughs> in a Great Gatsby remake, frankly. Have you heard National Anthem? F. Scott Fitzgerald did. Young and Beautiful was huge. Not only did it get two Grammy nominations, um, girlies love Great Gatsby. Not only girlies love Tobey Maguire, girlies love Leo, and girlies love Great Gatsby. And so if you were not, if you hadn't heard of Lana, you had now with this song. I know that this song was definitely the gateway if you were not on Tumblr and hadn't been exposed to the born to die of it all. That way you were hopping on the Lana train from this song and I do know a handful of people who heard this song and the floodgates were open to them for the Lana verse from there. Young and Beautiful came out in April and in June Lana filmed her short film Tropico, the accompanying short film to paradise. So Lana was not the first to start doing like the film accompanying an album. And like I said, she really is a film girly. She appreciates film and she is interested in incorporating the aesthetic and the visuals. She's really a full aesthetic project girly. You know, she might not call herself an era's artist, but she really is. All of her albums are, even though they are very distinctly her, they are of their own world. And even without a short film or like a Pinterest board for all of them, I could tell you what that short film would probably look like. And so I love that we actually got one for Paradise. Now, Tropico um, was not widely loved. It was a weird 
weird, oddly biblical trip at best, and bad and appropriative at times at worst. It definitely came across as appropriative of like the Latinx culture, um, something that Lana very much like kind of identifies with. She spent a lot of time in South Florida as well as Southern California. There is a lot of Latinx culture there. Still very much doing that and very much getting criticized for. Taco Truck X Venice Bitch um, on her last album is the most recent iteration of it. I am not Latinx. I do not have anything to say about that. I am just here to chronicle the scandal. Um, this is not the first appropriation she has been accused of. She also has been photographed wearing a full Native American headdress. If you are of the Latinx culture um, and you do have thoughts about Taco Truck X Venice Bitch and the kind of Lanita and Tropico of it all, please let me know. Paradise was really the beginning of her professing of her love for LA and California. She has talked about how she felt like New York was really her past and that California and Los Angeles was really her now and and her life currently. Um, it's really kind of another one of her huge inspirations. I talked about how Brooklyn was one of them, um, Southern California and Los Angeles specifically is another. Um, and we really, really, really see that being highlighted majorly here on Paradise and in Tropico. It's present a little bit on Born to Die, but really I would say that album is largely New York centric. Um, Paradise is more California centric. And then when we move into Old ultraviolence, you kind of get a mix between the two before steering all the way into Los Angeles as we move forward, but we are not there yet. Tropico is released later that year and people have a mixed response to it. People find it very appropriative and they're not entirely sure they think the music is good enough to uh, warrant all of this. In 2014 though, people do continue to love her insane hypnotic cinematic voice as she is present on another lead single for another blockbuster movie with her cover of Once Upon a Dream for Maleficent, which I absolutely lived for. I was really skeptical of that movie. I thought it was gonna be bad, but I loved her Once Upon a Dream cover and then I actually ended up loving the movie. Highly recommend it. Both Elle Fanning and Angelina Jolie did a great job. In early 2014, she also split from her boyfriend Barry and kind of continued to struggle to work on music. She said that she had actually really thought that after Paradise, she had said all that she had had to say, which is crazy to think about now, seeing how much work she's released since then. But she said her muse was very fickle and she didn't even really start working slowly until later in 2013. And while she did, she really struggled with perfectionism and what to include. And even when Ultraviolence, what she thought was done, she actually handed it to the producer, Dan Arbach from The Black Keys. And it was really kind of almost entirely reworked from that version. So it's crazy. Ultraviolence, spoiler alert, is not my favorite personal Lana album. I like it, um, but it's not even in my like top Five. But people say it is one of her best, but she actually really, I guess, struggled to write it and really struggled to figure out what it was going to be. Um, but for her, she said that she really felt like she took a lot of moments from her past that had been exciting to her and highlighted them in different songs throughout this album. Now, this was a distinct kind of turn away from the pop vibes of Born to Die. This was produced by Dan Arbach of The Black Keys, um, very much a rock indie artist, unlike the pop rock R&B team of producers that had worked on Born to Die. If Born to Die was the 20s and the 50s, this was the 60s and the 70s. In April, West Coast, definitely the poppiest, beatiest track on the entire record. In May, Shades of Cool and Ultraviolence were released, followed by the drop of the record and the final single, Brooklyn Baby, in June. What Ultraviolence really leans into isn't necessarily the cinema in the same way that Paradise and Born to Die leaned into her world building. It is more time and place. I feel like you feel all of Lana Del Rey's work in 360 degrees, seven senses, four dimensions, and 
while I felt like in Born to Die in Paradise, I might be in a movie, I feel like I am grounded on earth for ultraviolence and the music itself is making me feel like I might float away. There is no pop banger structure to be found. She is Pink Floyding, she is Led Zeppelining. But we are still Lana. We are still intoxicated, existential, and profound. But sonically, we have just kind of shifted from being in the Great Gatsby movie to walking home high as a kite in New York City, carrying your guitar, sweating under your leather jacket in July as you pass the red brick and the posters on the street. The reviews weren't 100% positive, but they were distinctly better than they were for Born to Die. People seemed to have respect for her as an artist now that they saw that she could do something different, something slightly more, maybe in their opinion, more prolific in artistry. Um, it felt like maybe she'd cut her teeth to them now. Um, I will say, I feel like the things that people were complimenting about ultraviolence were always present in Lana. I feel like her style, I feel like her vocals, I feel like her attention to detail what and her writing was always there. Do I feel like it became more poetic, more refined here in some ways? Yes, um, I just think that she had maybe earned people's respect in a way critically here that she hadn't yet from Paradise and Born to Die. So it was taken a little bit more seriously, critically. However, people did definitely like the first half more than the second, which I would absolutely have to agree with. I think by ultraviolence, people are starting to realize that not everyone will like Lana Del Rey's music, but everyone can appreciate how she sounds. Everyone can appreciate that she is good at what she does. The Endless Summer Tour kicks off in May, ends in June. It is a very short US and Canada amphitheater tour. This is the tour where she plays the Hollywood Bowl, which like Lana Del Rey playing the Hollywood Bowl, like I would die. Um, that's just so very like quintessential Lana. And that is actually where we are going to wrap up Lana 101 because from here we get into the honeymoon era, which I think is a distinct shift away from kind of this early Lana. So thank you guys so very much for watching. Let me know what you guys thought of Lana 101. Leave me a review on Rate Your Professor. Um, leave a comment down below if I missed anything or you have any thoughts about this time period that I talked about. About, give it a like if you liked it and I cannot wait to see you all ready with your notebooks open for Lana 102 coming soon. It is not going to be my next video. We are going to go back to some Taylor content and sprinkle in some other pop culture things as well but I hope you guys enjoyed this Lana moment. I feel like it's just the perfect time of year for it. I'm listening to Lana very much when the weather gets cold and like on and off when the weather is hot. She is always like my number two or number three artist on my Spotify rap so I'm clearly listening to her always but I just November is a great time for Lana. Um, if you have not gotten into her, I highly recommend it. If you need some suggestions, um, if you need suggestions for how to get into Lana Del Rey, maybe that'll be a video that I'll do too because I have a lot to say about that. Okay, thank you for attending Lana 101. I cannot wait to see you guys in the next one. Give it a like if you liked it. Subscribe if you'd like to see more and I cannot wait to see you next week.